Hey, to all the real estate professionals out there, I want to let you know the Buyer's Mind is sponsored by Homebridge Financial. Homebridge loan officers are experts in new home financing, and they bring sales ideas and strategies and market intelligence and programs that will help sell homes. To learn more about that, go to builder.homebridge.com. Homebridge Financial, home financing made easy. How can you be top of mind for your customers? Let's ask the question and get it answered today on The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome, everyone, once again to another episode of The Buyer's Mind. My name is Jeff Shore. I'm the host of this very podcast where we're trying to figure out how to take care of our buyers, how to get to understand them really, really well, and ultimately to be able to influence them. We want to be good influencers. And generally, when we think of the world of sales, we think of the word sales being almost synonymous with the word influencer. That is what we do. Influence to what? Influence to help people do what is already in their best interest. So if you've got in your mind that influence equals manipulation, you have a different definition than I do. And I would argue that you want to get that out of your mind. It's not healthy and it's not helping. Instead, we want to look at influence as a way to serve our customers. And Murph, I know you've dealt with a lot of salespeople uh, over time. Do, do you think... Do you think about salespeople as influencers or do you think about them more of just sort of like information sharers or or some other definition? Yeah, I, I think information sharers is probably the definition that pops to mind just top of head. Yeah, it, and I think that, that that's probably true for a lot of people. Uh, but the reality is that a great salesperson is there to solve problems, to influence people to do what is in their best interest. So you almost sort of look at it like a, uh, you know, like I've, I've got a problem I'm dealing with my knee right now. And a doctor that I'm working with, you know, he was very blunt with me to say, listen, you, you could do a number of different things, including nothing at all. That's on the list. But what you should do is this. And I don't think he's saying that because he wants to get rich working on my knee. I think he's saying that because he wants me better. And that's what influence is about. It's helping people to do that which is in their best interest. And so as we think about influence, we think about the ways that we can do that. We think about how likable we are. We think about how we solve problems. We think about the content that we can provide to our customer in order to solve those problems. And we're going to get into all of that on today's discussion on influence with John Hall. So our guest on the buyer's mic today, John Hall. He is the co-founder of calendar.com. We'll talk about how you end up with a spiffy uh, web address uh, like that. And uh, he, he's an expert uh, on influence, really. He's He uh, specializes in, in PR. He's a keynote speaker, and he's the author of the book, Top of Mind, Use content to unleash your influence and engage those who's, who matter to you. I'm holding the book in my hand as we speak, particularly of interest to me because uh, we share not only the same publisher, McGraw-Hill, we share the same editor. So, Casey, if you're listening out there, uh, shout out to you. Uh, John, welcome to The Buyer's Mind. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, let's have some fun. Where, where are you uh, physically on the planet right now? I'm in Columbia, Missouri, so I don't know if you hear that often. A lot of times when I say Columbia, people are like, oh, South America, but uh, no, it's right <laughs> smack dab in the middle of St. Louis and KC, so we've got a great university market here, and, and also we're kind of building a business campus out here, so we've got a good home. And you travel a fair amount, at least under normal conditions, so it's uh, it's good to be in the center of the country as far as that goes. I'm, I'm in Northern California, so I'm finding it, it seems like the when I travel, the East Coast is getting farther and farther away these days. Maybe it just has to do with uh, with travel. I don't know. But you are uh, the CEO, co-founder of uh, Calendar.com. Tell us about Calendar.com. Yeah. I mean, really my background, I, I, I exited my last company in 2018 with an acquisition and then uh, immediately kind of, uh, you know, once you kind of uh, go through an acquisition, you start looking at what your passions are and what you would do if, you know, money is not in the e equation necessarily. And, uh, and so for me, um, I actually was going to create a CRM that was uh, for salespeople and different people called uh, Thoughtful. And it was about uh, how we can engage people better. And that kind of lines up with top of mind. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was on that track. And what ended up happening is as we started um, doing it, I, we realized that 
uh, the people's excuse for not being thoughtful or not having enough time was um, was always time. They're like, I don't want to have enough time uh, to do a lot of the things I want to do uh, like this. And so it kind of created a barrier there with that CRM. And it just so happens one of my friends, his name is John Rampton. He was he had a passion for kind of the, the creating the modern day calendar. So we got together and ended up, he, you know, we, he helped this guy out at the right time at the right moment, just because he's a super helpful individual. And this person ended up happen, having or just happened to have the domain calendar.com. And mm-hmm. so it just worked out really well. And so now our kind of passion is, is you know, together creating the modern day calendar so that, uh, you know, people are focusing their time on what matters most to them. And, you know, it, and it creates the features that, can, you know, people can be uh, engaging people how they want. And so what's nice about that is that it aligns a lot of time, a lot of uh, with the content of Top of Mind, which is a book I wrote because part of engaging people consistently is focusing on the right ways to connect with people, the right ways to manage your time to do that and to create the habits that are ultimately going to make you a more engaging person. So it kind of works really well with uh, the content from the book. We've been uh, hearing a lot about content marketing over the course of the last several years. It's been the buzzword, and appropriately so, because content marketing is so powerful. But for those who are listening right now that that are, are either not entirely familiar with content marketing or who don't really see that as anything more than a, a, a function of the marketing department, but it has nothing to do with me personally, can you just give us a, a brief flyover of how you see content marketing and how content marketing drips down to the individual level? Sure, yeah. I mean, content marketing, I mean, people get fancy with the term, but in general, it's it's just a, a good way to engage people so that you're on their mind at the right time, at the right moments. And so it's it's consistent, hence they call it like content marketing because there's like consistent pieces of content that can engage you that moves you from someone's short-term memory to their long-term memory. So that, you know, for example, in sales, um, when someone, you know, a lot of times someone's not going to immediately want to buy something from you at that moment. It's impossible to always time it right as a a salesperson. However, if you're engaging them with content consistently, uh, there's a a lot better of a chance that you're gonna be on that long-term memory so that when they do have that need, I call it in the book, call it moments of vulnerability, where you have this, uh, in one of my speeches, I call it where, you know, in office space where the boss comes in and it's like, where's the TPS report? And the guy's just stomach sinks and you you just have this weird feeling. Uh, That happens a lot of times with a lot of companies where they need this moment this moment of vulnerability to run back to that salesperson or to that company. And so content is just an amazing way to do it. And then it's also one of the forms of marketing that is starting to be applied more to other parts of the company more than ever. And so, um, you know, in the past ads were very, you know, focused on marketing, but what we're learning is that silos are really, really dangerous for a company. That's not what the best companies out there do. They don't silo sales. They don't silo marketing. They don't silo recruiting. They say, hey, the, like it's actually as it's crazy as it is, salespeople are some of the best researchers that you'll ever get in your company. And um, if you read the book, I talk about how salespeople should be uh, doing a term called content triggering. So every time mm-hmm. a salesperson gets an engaging moment with someone, they should naturally communicate that back to the content team because a content team can fuel sales and uh, also recruiting in other areas. Same thing with recruiting. But like it, when a salesperson gets that information, they should get it back. Content should be created. That should be the trigger. And then they should be able to use that to nurture a sale, to reach more people, to gain trust. And so for me, content marketing is just an amazing way to stay top of mind and also earn trust so that it results in a in a sale in the right way you know it's interesting when you think about that concept of con of uh, of content triggering it seems very appropriate that that should bubble up from the sales professional because they're most closely tied to the customer and one of the things that drives me crazy about content marketing the way that it has been abused over time is that uh we call it content marketing but it's really an ad right it's it's an article that's going to tell you about how great we are but the reality is con- good content marketing, Lisa, now you're more of an expert on this than I am, but the way I see it, and you can uh, affirm or deny, that's fine. Uh, the way that I see it is that content marketing done right is a problem solving. It, it's asking the question, what is the what is the the hole in this customer's life, in this potential customer's life, and how do we fill that up front? How does that ring yeah. with you? Uh- yeah, I mean that's a great way to look at it. I mean, uh, for from my standpoint, it's it, you're listening. Like the best salespeople listen 
to customers and they understand the true pain points, the true needs there. And um, and what I like about the adding the content side is that there's different like the psychology when, when you look at the psychology of a person and how they receive information. Some people are verbal. Some people like reading. Some people like list you know listening in different ways or different mediums and. And I and uh, from a sales perspective or how you're engaging someone, you got to listen and you got to understand their pain points. The best sales people listen. Um, you know, I'm sure there's tons of books out there that say it, at least in my experience, that's how I feel. And with, you know, doing content the right way, it's not rocket science. And that's why, like I tell people, the best researchers for content is, is your sales team. You can go out mm-hmm. there and hire a, a censure. You can hire whoever you want. I don't care how brilliant those people are. Your salespeople are the smartest researchers in your company because they are the ones who are supposed to be listening, understanding, understanding motivations, understanding all that. And that's very powerful, um, you know, to use in a, in a overall company scheme because or a strategy just because when you um, have the right information, you're going to realize that like you could have 12 different salespeople. Uh, do this. And you'll start seeing that there's overlapping traits that people find engaging and overlapping pain points. And then you can actually like be more efficient with your time on how you create content and also with your brand messaging. And so it's just, it's a huge fuel that, um, and and if you do it right and set it up well, uh, it can fuel like you talked about me having a strong background in PR. Uh, I think PR and creating marketing assets for a company is one of the best ways to break down sales barriers. If your salespeople have constant, you know, uh, you know, placements going on, and they're just around. Like one of my companies I advise is a company called Adigy, and I love them because they are really big on owning your industry. They're like, we are going to help you own your industry through PR and search, so that when you are showing up, you're all over the place. And for sales. A lot of times when you look at buyer's journeys, they're not just listening to the salesperson. They're talking to friends. They're also searching on Google. They're looking at press. They're looking at what you're, you know, what people talk about you with. They're looking at reviews. And so I love the idea of, you know, sales teams that really put pressure on the company to truly own the industry, have that vision of we're going to take this thing over and own this real estate. And that's why I started advising that company because I loved the idea that they were very focused on that vision and doing placements to help it. We're talking to John Hall, author of Top of Mind. And uh, this book is largely about influence and how you how you stay influential with uh, people. You talk quite a bit about this idea. In fact, there's a whole chapter on being transparent and, and likable. Can we talk about likability here just a little bit and the connection between likability and uh, influence and staying top of mind. You know, it's it's interesting to me that when we think about you know being likable, there's a lot of salespeople who are like I don't care if they like me, I just want them to buy from me. And I think that the overwhelming evidence is proving that that likability factor is critical. But the question that I would ask for you is how does being likable uh, make you a good influencer? Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think sales, man, I, I mean, I know there's like sales people and people that are like, you know, all that matters is a sale, but I think that's very short-sighted thinking. I mean, I know some really good sales people that, you know, do that and they get a lot of short-term sales, but I, I think that they don't reach their full potential because likability can have a drastic impact on the amount like of, uh, you know, somebody that somebody spends with you in addition to their referrals and, you know, in addition to upselling, in addition to creating champions within companies to keep, you know, not only the sale, but also to keep uh, the retention going. And so for me, likability is so important. And it's funny, like I've seen so many things where price is more, where it, it's just, it's, it's funny how um, you, you go to a corporation that has a massive budget and they're going to deal with who they like. Um, there might be a cheaper product, but they want to deal with who they like. And I constantly see people choose people with even lesser services for because they, they enjoy being around and working with them. Even if it's not on purpose, it's a natural psych. There's a natural psychology that we want to gravitate towards people we like and we want to champion people we like. And so and it's not just about being the popular person. It's about. Uh, you know, forming trust, being authentic. Uh, in the book, I talk about authenticity is something that I struggled with my whole life because I tried to be Mr. Popular in high school and I tried to do, you know, different things to seem cool. And But people have BS meters, you know, as cool as we think we can be to sell someone, um, there's a natural uh, gut, uh, you know, reaction sense that people or whatever you call it, a spider sense or whatever. But um, it's a it's a sense that people have that they can sense that they might buy something from you now, but there's going to be a weird feeling afterwards. And that feeling might come up when they think about buying from you again. So 
I think that um, likability is extremely important um, in not just sales, but also just to, you know, be authentic. In the book, I talk about gaining trust and, um, you know, everything you can do. Like right now, we're in a trust war because of generational differences. You have race relations, you have media, you have politics, you have all these things affecting it. And so likability and trust are so key right now because um, there's there's just a lack of trust and there's a lot there's a lack of likability out there. So we have to work really, really hard to earn that. And it's going to create more champions referrals and uh, ultimately long term, even be, like you know, the selfish part of a, a salesperson that, you know, down the road when they want to be a CRO or they want to that next you know role. Uh, you got to keep these things in mind and be very focused because, you know, life, you know, there's a, it's a small world out there. And, you know, if you're not somebody who looks out for people and truly helps people and, you know, is kind, uh, not necessarily kind, you don't need to be like super, super nice. But if you, I think the key thing is you connect people to value and you treat, the, you know, you, you gain their trust. I think that results in the best sort of, uh, you know, sales opportunities in the future. In the book, you talk a lot about how to leverage content and uh, how to use that confluence to make you an influencer, to make you a- to, to assert your authority and to be more trustworthy because you are solving those problems. But let's talk about this on an individual level. So we'll take a sales professional who's selling, uh, let's just say uh, insurance, right? Car, home, life, whatever it is, and trying to build a business um, might be interested. And this might be a great opportunity to be able to leverage content as a way to expand reach and expand authority and uh, build their business. On the other hand, the thought of sitting down and, as you point out in the book, the very thought of sitting down and writing a 600-word blog post, and even if you did that, where do you put it? And uh, it was just sort of at loss. So can you give us some baby steps for people who would say, yeah, I think providing great content is in theory a good idea. I have no idea how to do that. Yeah. And and I think that I was just looking at the chapters, honestly, I haven't looked at my my book in a while. So let me look and make sure I'm saying the right chapter. Uh, But if you look at chapter seven, uh, it's it's my journey. And it talks about like, and everybody will talk to me about like, oh, man, you're you're a great writer or this. I'm like, actually, no, I'm not. I think my ACT score in writing was like lower than a monkey. Uh, I'm actually not the best uh, writer. And I'm not great with uh, the written word. Um, but what I do like to do is bring in resources um, that are good. I feel like I do have some ideas and experiences, failures and successes that people can, you know, learn from uh, just like anybody. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to communicate that and help the, you know, others, the next generation, other people around me. I want to practice what I preach and earn trust. And so to do that, I need to bring in the best. And so if you look at my book, actually, I don't, you know, if you look at the beginning of it, um, you know, I gave credit. A lot of people give credit to their wife or, you know, dedicate and no offense if you, you know, you did it to a spouse or a loved one, because uh, a lot of my friends do. Um, but uh, to be honest, my wife didn't have much to do with this book. I mean, I think she, when she actually got it, she joked around that she wanted a copy that wasn't signed. Um, and so she gave me, a, you know, so for me, it, wa- it wasn't something like that. It was. I I say to all the writers, editors, and creators behind many of the best pieces of content who don't give credit. And then I also give, um, you know, the people credit who was was involved in the book um, or where, you know, I I basically give actually Casey, your editor that you know, what part of the book is giving recognition to people who deserve it. So I said, acknowledgements, Ben Lossman, you're truly one of the most talented writers and a creative mind who expertly shaped my words. Uh, and then I say to the amazing team of women who helped edit and craft this book, Nikki Bartels, Natalie Simon, Taylor Oster, Kelsey Meyer, and Casey Ebro. And so when you look at that, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I truly believe in you bring people around you and you get the right resources. And if you look at that breakdown, there's an editor, there's a strong writer, um, there's somebody who understands uh, PR and distribution in there. You know, my advice to like a, one of your audiences is you shouldn't put all the pressure on yourself. You should look at what resources around you can help and or can be brought in or, you know, I mean, like a lot of times people talk to me. I mean, and you can have, I mean, I'll give you my email address. I mean, it's just John Hall speaking at gmail.com. And if someone's looking, it's like, I, I would just say, Hey, John, I, we're at this stage. Like we, I can't hire anybody. What would you do? And my advice would be different. Mine would say, okay, you've got a hustle. Here's what, and you're not a strong writer. Cool. Okay. Here's what I would do. Um, but if, but if some people are like, Oh, I have a marketing director and I have this you know role, then I'd say, okay, like I basically look at it as a chess board and it's like, do we have a full board or are we just playing with the queen in the night? Um, you know, and so I think that it varies per person, but ultimately there should be no barriers that prevent you from creating some sort of engaging content, 
Um, every single company at this point should be creating some level of it. So there needs to be a commitment, e even if it's just at a minimum level of, hey, I'm going to create a guide that is like everything that someone needs to know when I'm talking to them about sales, because I want to be able to hand it to them. And I want to be able to, because once again, people communicate and receive information differently. Uh, and I want to talk to them verbally, but I also want to get them written. And I don't want to come off too salesy. So this is going to be educational. It's going to address their pain points, their challenges. It's going to educate them. Um, and it might have some, you know, uh, credibility points in there too, if we got some press or things like that. So I think that that's like the minimum level where you at least have one marketing asset that you can nurture someone with. And then it just goes on there, depending on budget, what your resources are and, and all that. Let's talk about just success mentality in general here for a little bit. You, 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 know, you had founded a, a company that that you was later acquired. You've got Calendar dot com. You've written for Forbes. You're a speaker. You're an author. Uh, you're sort of a serial entrepreneur. When we think about um, uh, you, your success journey here for just a little bit, how how much is that achievement drive? Uh, rooted in what it is that you do. I mean, I, I, uh, Mike, this is the first time we've ever talked, John, but my guess is that uh, suddenly if you had all the money in the world and you never had to work again in your life, there's no way you would retire because you just need to win. You need to succeed. How much does that achievement drive a part of the success, not just for you, but for successful people? And just philosophize about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, for uh, for me, I mean, for me, I am at the point. It's it's not the money that motivates me. Um, you know, at this point in my life, it is like I think everybody has different motivations. Mine is I love being surrounded by like great people, and I love building things and making things better, and in, it basically enhancing things, either lives or companies. And so I'm doing exactly that. So I'm, I think I'm, you know, somewhat living my dream right now and I'm very blessed and lucky to be doing that um, right now. And so, you know, my drive is that it's, it's, it's basically, Hey, like at my checkpoint every quarter when, you know, I'm talking to my business partners, like, did we, do we have people, you know, on our team that, um, you know, we trust, we respect um, that, you know, want to, want to come to work and they get excited about being here. Um, if that's not the case and we need to make some adjustments at the same time is that, um, you know, I, I look at success in different ways now uh, than I did when I was young. I just looked at it only as money. Um, and it's very interesting. Oh, well, and now granted though, I've been through acquisition. I've had different, you know, experiences. Uh, that's not even my first one. I've done real estate deals and different things like that. But, um, you know, at this point in my life, I, I'm just look at success as there's different measures of it. There's, um, the people you're around the community. If you look at, um, Harvard's longest 75 year old study that they did a Ted talk on, uh, it was community that brought uh, and you know friends and connections that brought the the most happiness. It wasn't money. And that now there was a level of money that took place. I think it was sixty or seventy thousand dollars in annual salary. Um, but the, the the measurement of success, you know, there there's community, there's life experiences, there's um, a, a variety of things that you can measure wealth. And I think we have a new version of wealth. I think like from a like for example with the sales point of view. I think that, um, you know, you can look at direct sales numbers, but you, I think that for me and the best salespeople I know, look at their direct sales number, but they also look at what they're doing to contribute to move the needle for the company. And so that's a, a pride issue that I look at different than money. That is pride in one's work and company. Um, and so money is a lot of times attached to it uh, because numbers are a great quantitative way to motivate that. Um, but for me, I think that people have to truly understand what motivates them to bring the best out of them. So if we're talking sales, I want people to be selling what they either believe in or be surrounded by good people or have certain elements there that that drives motivation. Because I think that if you're just only focused on the money, you don't bring the absolute best out of you. Now, I'm not going to BS you. Money matters. And, and most of the great salespeople I know, you know, do think of it and they, they do value that. But at this point in my, in my life, I, I look at it is that, um, yeah, I'm going to have quantitative metrics there. Uh, but if you truly get me motivated, I am a force of nature and I will stop it pretty much like I would just go through any barrier. Uh, now, obviously, I'm not like not breaking the law or anything, but like go through barriers very easily and do things that, um, you know, I think that 
uh, are above just the normal if I do find that motivation. And, and like I said, to me, it's the, it's the people working towards a common goal and building things so that, you know, we can look back and, and, you know, not, I mean, going through the acquisition a couple of times, you know, in 2018, it was just such a meaningful thing to look at what we created and, you know, from two people sitting in an office corner. And so that's what drives me and motivates me. John Hall, thanks for being on that. But before we let you go, we're going to put you on the hot seat. Some rapid fire questions, rapid fire answers. You ready? Let's do it. Here we go. Your very first job was what? I was a host at a, sl- uh, a water park where I would tell people to go down the slide. <laughs> there you go. Love it. Uh, an yeah. album from your, your youth that you listen to over and over again, or an artist, an album or an artist. Oh, uh, boys to men. I mean, I, for some reason, I don't know. I was down with the hip hop and R and B, R R and B early on. I love it. Love it. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood. Ooh, the most beautiful place. I love Jamaica. Uh, I think, uh, there's a place that we visit that's right on the beach and, uh, going back to the people. I love the people, the culture. It makes me uh, grateful for what we have here and, and they're just an appreciative culture. And so love standing there and looking at their beautiful sunsets. Any book you read early in life that had a profound impact on the rest of your life? Uh, it's crazy. It's, uh, David Bach, The Automatic Millionaire, I read at a very young age. My mom gave it to me and taught me personal finance at a very early age. And it's it's mm. been able to put me on a path that was amazing. And so uh, I've read a lot better books since then. But that was one that, uh, no offense, David's a, a part of a group I am. It's a great book. And, yeah. and yeah. I think it was great early on. You know, it's it just on a side note, I, I it wasn't about money management per se, but but for whatever reason, in high school, I read Erwin Shaw's Rich Man, Poor Man, and uh, and it was about an entrepreneur. And I'll tell you what, it sparked an entrepreneurial fire for, just in a fictional book. And I was just like, that's what I want to <laughs> do. Uh, any, uh, let's see, a movie you've seen multiple times, doesn't matter when it comes on, you have to stop and watch it. Oh man, there's a, for some reason I have a thing for the greatest showman. I don't know. I could just, yeah, uh, it's yeah, great movie. I don't know why. Great movie. Yeah. All right. And then finally your very first celebrity crush. A uh, celebrity crush. That would probably, uh, as crazy as it was, it was Julia Roberts and pretty woman. There you go. Yeah, it's a solid mm-hmm. choice. All right. You're off to Hudson. Mm-hmm. John Hall. Thank you so uh, very much for joining us. How do people find you, John? Uh, I don't hide. I mean, like I, I don't have an assistant that does things like I actually like responding to things myself, um, yeah. you know, and, and I'm supposed to be good at productivity with owning calendar.com. And so yeah. I would say uh, John Hall speaking at gmail.com is my uh, email uh, LinkedIn. I'm very active there. I have a newsletter with uh, that. I, I was one of the early people there. So about uh, 160,000 people are a part of that. And so I do actually comment and, and engage people there. So go on LinkedIn, subscribe to the newsletter. And then uh, from there, I mean, Twitter, um, active there. But uh, I would say those first two are the the common ones. All right. And I'll tell you, we've been doing this uh, podcast now for a few years. You are the first person when I asked that question who has given us their email address. And so uh, good for you. Love it, love it, love it. The personal touch. John Hall, thanks for being on The Buyer's Mind. Thanks for having me. All right. There you go. Great conversation. Uh, Murphy, you you get the sense that John Hall is going to rule the world one day. Was Was that just me? You know, he is uh, pretty energetic, and uh, goodness knows, he's got his fingers in a lot of pies, uh, taking care of a lot of different things. He's very entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah, he is. But, but you know, that achievement drive that separates particularly successful salespeople from everyone else is probably the number one factor uh, when we look at what makes a great salesperson great. That positive energy is important. The, the, the need to learn, that's all important. But I don't think anything supplants the idea of achievement drive. And John Hall is just the kind of guy that just has to win. But I love the idea that uh, uh, when you you look at um, the way that you want to influence, you should be thinking of it strategically. So even uh, just, just after the interview that we had with John after the phone, he was like, how can I help you? How can I help you? And he said that a couple of different times. How can I help you? And that's his way to serve in order to have more of an influence. So I look at him, I go, well, the guy's clearly successful and he wants to serve. And I just want to challenge all of you as sales professionals. Uh, boy, how do you, how can you do that? How can you serve more fully? How can you serve even without knowing what you're going to get in return, but serve, serve for serve sake. 
The other thing that was great about the conversation that I enjoyed was the conversation about likability. The specific connection between likability and influence, Robert Cialdini certainly talks about that in his book on influence theory. But there are so many benefits of being likable. And I have an assignment for you, sales professional. I want you to take a piece of paper and just write the words at the top, benefits of likability. Just write benefits of likability and then brainstorm. Just list them out. What are some of the many, many benefits of being likable to your customer. I think what you're going to find here is that the benefits are so strong that it will increase your desire to be likable. And when we are likable, well, guess what happens? We're better influencers. This is a great opportunity for you to flex that influence muscle, both through your likability and in all other areas. At the end of the day, we want to influence people to be able to do the right thing for them. Because at the end of the day, you know what we want to do. We want to change their world. We'll see you next time.